to support our citizenship application workshop this upcoming Saturday. We are very excited. We have a lot of participants registered for this event and it's going to be a long day. So we are really truthfully thankful for um, for you to be willing to support us. Um, today's training is meant for our screening volunteers. Uh, you need to be an attorney or a DOJ representative um, to, to be able to do this legal consultation. And um, today's session is a small group. Uh, this is our second session for, for this specific, specific training. So since I'm alone, I won't be able to monitor the chat. But if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to unmute yourself and um, let us know what your questions are. I hope to be uh, somewhat of a, a more collaborative uh, training orientation today for you. Um, and I want to get started so that we can end in time. But again, as a reminder, um, you will also be receiving additional training on Saturday morning. Um, more about the logistics of the workshop itself, uh, kind of the order of the work that you will be doing. And as an additional reminder, um, there will be expert screeners um, at your station available to answer any questions at any point. And we also have complex experts in case uh, there are any red flags that arise with your participant, you can refer them to the complex expert uh, for further screening. So I am going to get us started and thank you so much again for joining. So on behalf of the City of Seattle Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, welcome to the Citizenship Workshop Legal Training. This webinar is intended for volunteer attorneys who will be conducted, uh, conducting the initial screenings of potential citizenship applicants, and also for immigration attorneys who will be serving in other volunteer roles at the workshop and who would want to brush up on naturalization red flags. This training will cover some commonly used immigration terms and acronyms. Uh, we will review the legal requirements for naturalization and look closely at the red flag screening issues for naturalization applicants. First, there are a number of immigration terms that you may hear in the context of a citizenship workshop that it would be helpful to be familiar with. And just as a reminder, our screening volunteers are um, attorneys or DOJs, but our attorneys are not all immigration practitioners. Uh, some do not have uh, background in immigration, so these um, terms are going to be very useful to you. And then we also have some do practice immigration law, but as you may know, immigration law is very complex and there's many different areas within immigration. So some of you are immigration practitioners who do not practice naturalization specifically. So this is our refresher. There are various federal agencies involved in the immigration system. Within the Department of Homeland Security or DHS, three main agencies administer the immigration laws. USCIS or US Citizenship and Immigration Services processes and grants immigration benefits, including naturalization. Custom and Border Protection or CDP is in charge of securing the borders and enforcing immigration law at the border and ports of entry. Uh, and finally, Immigration and Customs Enforcement or ICE is the interior enforcement arm of the Immigration Service and they handle detention and deportation. The Department of Justice oversees the Immigration Courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals, both which are administrative courts. Other departments, such as the Department of Labor and the Department of State, are also involved in different aspects of the immigration system. This slide uh, lists a number of immigration-related terms or acronyms that you might hear at the Citizenship Workshop to highlight a few. LPR refers to Lawful Permanent Resident, which is someone who has a green card. Everyone who applies to naturalize or applies for citizenship must be an LPR. An A number or alien number is an eight or nine digit number assigned to a non-citizen by one of the other immigration agencies at the time their immigration file is created. Uh, GMC refers to good moral character, 
which is a naturalization requirement, as well as some other immigration benefits. The N-400 is the form number for the naturalization application, which is the form that we will be completing at our workshop. Uh, skipping down to the bottom, removal and deportation are used almost interchangeably to mean when a person is expelled from the United States. Removal, though, is the more current term, and deportation is one type of removal. There are several ways to obtain U.S. citizenship. By far, the most common is by being born within the borders of the United States or U.S. territory, such as Puerto Rico or Guam. Um, one can also acquire U.S. citizenship at birth. If, both, um, if born outside of the United States to one or both uh, U.S. citizen parents, as long as certain other requirements are met. Um, another means to obtain U.S. citizenship is for a child who is a permanent resident to derive citizenship from a parent who naturalizes or is otherwise a U.S. citizen. And finally, uh, local permanent residents may become U.S. citizens through the naturalization process, which is the focus of this citizenship workshop. Looking a little bit more closely at children and citizenship, although children and under the age of 18 are not allowed to apply for naturalization under the current law, known as the, as the Child Citizenship Act, Children automatically become citizens when several conditions are met. One or both parents are U.S. citizens, either through birth or naturalization. The child is a lawful permanent resident, and the child is in legal and physical custody of the U.S. citizen parent. Because derivation of citizenship occurs by operation of law, sometimes people will be U.S. citizens and not even know it. This has happened at multiple uh, workshops before where we get participants wanting to apply for citizenship and then they find out that they became citizens through their parents without knowing. Um, the Child Citizenship Act is perspective only in that only people who are under 18 as of its effective date, uh, February 27, 2001, qualify. So prior laws are applied to prior time periods. Um, and I just, I want to, um, Take a side note, right now we're going to be covering um, the like eligibility requirements for citizenship so you get an idea of the context of why the questions that are asked in the N-400 form are asked and why the questions in our screening form, which is the document that you will be completing with the clients, asks those kinds of questions. Um, it's good for you to have this context, but you won't necessarily need to have these all completely memorized and feel completely natural to all of these rules. The screening form will guide you and it'll flag for you if it's a yes or no question, it'll flag for you whether a red flag has arised. So this is just for you to feel more comfortable understanding uh, what are the requirements of eligibility for citizenship and what USCIS is looking for in these applications. So I don't I, just to, to not overwhelm you with all of this information today. Um, yeah, the laws of derivation are can be complicated because it turns on a person's age when various requirements were met and which law was in effect at the time. But there are various charts that lay out the law during different time periods and depending on whether you're analyzing whether someone acquires citizenship at birth or whether they derived it from a parent at some later date. Um, because someone can be a U.S. citizen under these laws without knowing it, it's important to ask whether someone has a U.S. citizen parent at the first step to determine whether they may already be a citizen. So now let's turn to the legal requirements for naturalization. This slide shows the basic naturalization requirements. We will go over each of them in more detail, uh, except for the first one, which is that the naturalization applicant needs to be at least 18 years old at the time of filing their application. So we have residence requirements, physical presence, must have good moral character, 
uh, speak and read and writing some English. You must pass the US history and civics, civics tests and then must be willing to take the oath of allegiance. So let's get started covering eligibility requirements. There are several uh, aspects to the residence requirement. The first part is that a naturalization applicant must have a lawful admission as a permanent resident. Lawful admission requires that the person was eligible for permanent residence at the time that they obtained the status. So, for example, if they obtained their permanent residence through marriage to a U.S. citizen, or a lawful permanent resident, um, or a lawful permanent resident, and then it's later came to light that that was not a valid marriage, that person would not have been lawfully admitted to permanent residency. In addition to lawful admission. An applicant for naturalization must have been a permanent resident for at least five years before submitting their citizenship application. Applicants who are married to U.S. citizens, however, can apply after three years of residence as long as they were married to the U.S. citizen spouse for three years and are living in marital union with that spouse at the time of filing their naturalization application. In counting when residence begins, there is a special rule for asylees and refugees. For asylees, their residence starts one year prior to the date that their adjustment to permanent residence was approved. Uh, for refugees, their permanent residence date goes back to the date of their admission as a refugee. So these dates should be reflected on the green card, but you may want to check uh, that this roll back rule was accounted for. So this is an example of the current version of the green card, also known as the Lawful Permanent Resident Card, or the I-551. The green card is an individual's proof of status as an LPR. As you can see, the residence is printed on the bottom of the card. Um, and the category that the person was admitted in is in the middle of the card. So you can see, I don't think you can see my my monitor, my mouse here showing you where it says category RE8. So like in this case, the category was RE8, which is a refugee category. Uh, the A number is in uh, is the nine digit uh, number printed on the middle of the card. Here it is labeled uh, USCIS number. So that is the A number. And that's where you can find the information on the green card. Although uh, green cards need to be renewed every 10 years, it's important to flag that LPR status itself doesn't expire. So a person can stay as an LPR and never become a citizen indefinitely. Returning to the residence requirements uh, for citizenship, the five years of residency must be continuous. So in other words, during the last five years, certain long absences from the United States may break the continuity of residence. Usually trips outside of the US for six months or less don't affect continuous residence, but trips between six months and a year may break residence. So it's a question of showing ties to the United States while, um, while, while out of the country. These ties include things like keeping a home in the United in the US, uh, family remaining in the United States, returning to a job, maintaining bank accounts, and so forth while you're away on a trip. USCIS presumes that a trip between six months and a year has disrupted residency, but the applicant may rebuke this presumption by providing objective evidence of ties to the United States. Trips of one year or longer automatically break the continuous uh, residence. So an LPR will have to accrue at least four years and one day of residence after returning from a trip a year or longer in order to be eligible for naturalization. So we have covered um, that the admission to residency had to be lawful and it has to be continuous. So long periods of absences, um, you have to flag, and this is why we also ask participants how they got their green card, and then 
all of their trips outside of the United States uh, for the last five years. And that is kind of how we go about this analysis. Another issue to consider when looking at an LPR time outside of the United States is abandonment of residency. This is not a naturalization eligibility issue, but it can make the person deportable. So in deciding this, an immigration judge will consider whether during a long trip, the person intended to abandon their residency, or if they always intended to return to the United States after a specific event. There are a few other parts uh, to the residency requirement. A naturalization applicant must live in the USCIS service district where they file their N-400 for at least three months before filing. So all of our participants tomorrow have to have been residents of Seattle for at least, um, or at least within the USCIS service district of Seattle for at least three months. They must maintain continuous residence See in the United States for from filing until the oath ceremony, which is currently about eight months to a year after applying for uh, naturalization. They can still take short trips out, out of the United States during this time, but not so long as to break continuity of residence. An applicant can file their N-400 applications as many as 90 days before they complete their five years of residency. So in other words, they can file four years and nine months after receiving their LPR card. Uh, if filing under the three-year rule, they can file after two years and nine months of lawful permanent residence. So this means that um, at our workshop, you might be encountering someone who um, has been a, a lawful permanent residence, resident not for five years quite yet, but they're almost getting to the, the five year rule. So um, you, you can still um, apply if there's three months left before the five years are completed. The USCIS won't process that application until the five years are, um, are there, but they will at least receive the application and kind of put it on their files. And please feel free to stop at any time if you have any questions. I will be sharing all of these slides with my notes um, for you, and you will also have our screening form, which will guide your discussion as well. So another naturalization requirement is physical presence. A citizen, uh, ap citizenship applicant must be physically present within the borders of the United States for half of the statutory period. So this equals to 30 months for general applicants or 18 months for those applying under the three-year rule. Three-year rule being you married a US citizen spouse, so you don't have to wait five years, you can apply after the three years. So even if an applicant doesn't have long trips, but instead they have many short trips outside of the United States, uh, you may need to count up um, the days of travel to ensure that they met the physical presence requirement. So note that any day, any part of a day spent inside of the United States counts as a full day for meeting physical presence. Um, going to Canada does count as having left the country. Just as a reminder. So we have also for passing naturalization citizenship, the English requirement, which requires uh, an applicant to have a uh, converse in English at about a fourth grade level. Uh, the, the test during the interview is they will make them read and write one or two basic sentences in English. And the English ability to determine um, will be determined by the officer at USCIS. So most of our participants at the workshop will need to have at least a basic level of English understanding to be able to pass these, this exam unless they qualify for an exemption. At the workshop, we will still have interpreters available because the English literacy level that is required to pass your citizenship uh, interview is not the same 
as the level of English that it's required to fully understand the legal consultation that will be provided to them at our workshop. So we really want to make sure that the participants are like fully understanding the content of their, their form and they're answering everything truthfully to the best of their abilities. Sorry, give me one second. I don't know why my notes are not here, but it's okay. So there are exemptions to the English uh, test, as I mentioned before. Um, and this is if you are over 50 years old and have been an LPR for at least 20 years, um, or if you have are a little bit older, if you're 55 years old and have been an LPR for 15 years, then you don't have to meet the English requirement and you can um, take the, the test in your language with an interpreter at the, at the interview, but you still have to pass the history exam. Um, and if they have a medical condition um, or a disability that prevent, prevents them from learning English at all, then they don't have to speak English or pass the test. But this is a strict standard and it requires a medical waiver form that we do not cover in our workshop. So in if there's the case that our participant believes that they're unable to learn English due to a disability or past trauma, then we will refer them out for a one on one legal representation where the attorneys can support them in getting that medical waiver signed by a, by a physician that has been certified by USCIS. And then finally, at the interview, participants, uh, aside from reviewing their forms and passing the English literacy test, they also have to take a US history and civics exam. There's 100 questions to study on the US history, geography, and government. Um, and then the applicants are given 10 questions and they need to get six correctly. Um, but if you if the applicants are 65 years old and have been LPRs for at least 20 years, they can study out of a shorter list. So when you're assessing the participants English ability, if you are using an interpreter, we have a um, English like literacy test card um, that will basically have you have a very basic, simple conversation with the participant, have them um, repeat a phrase after you or write it down. And that will be your way of assessing whether they will uh, be eligible to pass the English literacy test or if we should be referring them out for ESL classes before they can apply. So um, as I mentioned before, there's th this is the disability waiver or form N648, which exempts the applicants from the English and US history requirements. They must be a medically determinable physical, developmental or mental disability for these. Um, and it is the standard is that they are unable to learn due to that disability. But we do not complete these forms in, in our workshop because they're more time consuming. So these clients will be referred out. So I just want to flag and point out that citizenship is a serious um, application. It brings so many benefits to our applicants and their families, but it is also um, a delicate process. A rejected application can mean much more than just disappointment. It can mean there's loss in the fee waiver, um, or it can be losing your status and deportation. So it is very important that we are um, going through the screening process uh, thoroughly and we're flagging any potential risks for our expert volunteers. Um, but as well with the model that we have um, for our workshops, what is 
what is beneficial for the applicants is that they get three different opportunities with three different stations to have a legal volunteer review their case. And so at screening, the screening form is a deconstructed version of the N-400 form. Then at the next station in forms, they will go through the format again. And then in quality review, they will review and have a final expert review in the case. So there's three sets of eyes going through everything and um, and that it'll, it'll be reassuring enough that all, everything is being covered and reviewed properly. So the final requirement for naturalization is the good moral character requirement. And this is the most complex requirement and the one that most people run into trouble with. Many good moral character issues overlap with removal issues. So the law does not define what good and uh, what good moral character is, but it does list um, the types of conduct that prevent from someone from showing good moral character. These are listed at INA section 101F. And these are many of the issues that you will be screening for at the screening station. And now we will, uh, we will go over them in greater detail. So we think about screening for good moral character as a three-step process. First, is the person barred from establishing good moral character under one of the mandatory bars? This means that they will have to wait until disqualifying act or behavior moves out of the five-year statutory period. Second, could the person be denied under one of the discretionary grounds? So this means that they can either try to overcome the disqualifying factor or wait until, or wait until it is out of the statutory period. And then finally, do any of the good moral character issues or anything else in the person's immigration history make them potentially removable or deportable from the United States? To be eligible for naturalization, an applicant must show that they have been a person of good moral character for the five years prior to submitting their citizenship application. So as with the residency requirement, this period is shortened to three years if married to a U.S. citizen. The statute lists a number of types of conduct that, if occurring within the last five years, mean that a person can't show good moral character. We refer to these as mandatory but temporary bars. So, for example, if someone practiced polygamy during the last five years, they would be barred from showing good moral character until the conduct occurred more than five years ago. The law also contains discretionary bars. These prevent the person from showing good moral character unless they can show extenuating circumstances. For example, if someone didn't pay their required child support that they owed during the last five years, they would be barred unless they can pro provide an explanation for why they were unable to do so. In making this discretionary decision, an immigration officer is supposed to use the standard of the average citizen in the community. But remember, perfect moral character is not required. So this chart lists the kinds of conduct that prevent people from showing good moral character if they occurred within uh, during the statutory period. Note, however, that there are a couple of permanent bars uh, that prevent people from ever showing good moral character. These include a conviction for murder at any time or a conviction for an aggravated felony after November 29 of 1990. Aggravated felony is a category of crimes under immigration law, which includes a wide range of offenses from theft uh, with a year sentence or to sexual offenses, drug crimes, and crimes of violence, and many more. So the remainder of the list on the left-hand side are the bars that are mandatory if they occurred within the last five years. They are temporary in that once they are more than five years old, then the person is again eligible to show good moral character. So the list on the right contains acts that may cause immigration to deny because of lack of good moral character. 
unless the person can show extenuating circumstances. For example, a person may owe back taxes, but it's on a payment plan to the IRS, or they have a reckless driving conviction, but they can provide a reasonable explanation for what happened. So often it is helpful to submit evidence showing community involvement or other positive equities for an officer to consider the balancing test. Um, I, I also do want to point out that our applicants for our workshop are all meant to be um, straightforward, easy cases, and our participants are meant to be pro se applicants. So if if you are screening a participant and there are any red flags coming, um, like showing, uh, if there's uh, any sort of criminal history, those are the kind of red flags that we would most likely refer out. You will first want to collect as much information as you can. Um, if it's a tra traffic violation, there's no problem. But if there's further criminal history, you will want to flag our uh, complex experts attorney and then uh, we will likely refer them out so that they can receive direct legal representation and not file pro se, just to ensure that um, everything has been assessed properly. So uh, you won't need to necessarily go into uh, very big detail as to their uh, history, criminal history. That's when you will likely just find them uh, a referral slip. OK, so now we'll turn to the red flags screening process at the naturalization workshop. We have covered our eligibility criteria for naturalization, and now we're going to be discussing the red flags in more detail. So this is the general flow of our citizenship workshop. You will have been sent uh, several short videos explaining the process. We do have videos and I have not sent them to you, but um, I can send them if you're interested. Um, and they just explain the process and the logistics of the workshop. Um, but each participant will have at least two immigration attorneys reviewing their case during the workshop to ensure success in their application. Uh, our participants will go through intake if they have not already been registered and came with their intake filled out then they will go to your screening station where you will be screening for any red flags. Participants that uh, are not eligible or have been uh, found with red flags will be sent uh, to our copy and exit station for referrals. And if they are eligible, then they will go to forms um, for filling out the N-400 and potentially fee waivers. And then final quality review experts will review the final forms. And then at copy and packaging, they will make sure that the whole application is printed and put in the right order and then give the client their final um, final package. So the screening station is the top stop after intake, and this is where the volunteer attorney screen participants for red flags and other eligibility factors such as English language skills. Experienced immigration attorneys review each case and decide if the person should be referred out or can go forward. Participants will either proceed to the form station to complete the N-400, uh, go to the referral experts because they shouldn't apply now, or because they need to obtain other documents to determine eligibility, or they will see an experienced immigration attorney for a consult because they have a serious red flag. So all pro bono attorneys uh, at the screening station are covered also by the liability insurance of uh, our pro bono nonprofit partners. So let's take a look at the steps for screening the screening process. Um, when you first meet a participant, you introduce yourself, ask for the tracking form that they will be uh, coming with. Uh, which is the participant, uh, which the participant received that intake. And then this form will be your guide listing all the steps to take with each participant. You will have to complete as a screener the first page of the tracking form, which includes the client's information um, and any red flags that you have seen after the screening. Um, first, before you get started working with the participant, review the limited legal services agreement with them. 
The agreement covers issues such as confidentiality and the importance of being truthful, given the potential consequences of denial or, or deportation. And then screeners um, uh, will return the, the agreement back to the participant. All documents will be collected from the participant in our exit station. So you will not keep any of the documents for yourself. So next, go through the eligibility screening as outlined on the tracking form, which includes looking at the person's green card, checking their age, checking how long they've been a permanent resident, determine if they're eligible for an exemption to the English language requirement based on the age or residency under the 5020 or 5515 rules. And then proceed to the red flag screening form, which begins with the questions related to English ability. Um, you will use the English literacy test cards to evaluate English skills um, if they are using an interpreter. So if a few misspellings uh, or mispronunciations are usually not a problem for passing the test. Um, remember that it does like individuals with shaky English should be, ref but they if they have shaky enough English, they should be referred to ESL classes, but they can choose if they wish to continue in the workshop. Individuals with no English literacy skills should be encouraged to wait to apply for citizenship until they have acquired basic literacy or until they qualify for an English language exemption. So next, uh, you will go over the entire red flag screening form, also called our screening uh, screening form with the individual. And after you're finished, review any yes answer questions with one of the immigration attorneys. And then at the end, once you're done with the screening form, please remember that you and any expert screeners should uh, sign the tracking form before letting the participant move forward to the next station. So, yeah, just as a reminder, all of the materials stay with the participant throughout the workshop. Um, please fill out the screening form completely. Even if you realize that the participant is going to be referred out, we still consider our screening a legal consultation and a useful service for our participants. And we want to make sure that we have done a uh, full screening before we send them um, to our next uh, workshop. So you should have received uh, copies of our screening form, which I highly recommend to for you to take a look uh, and just have a read before Saturday to familiarize yourself, yourself with the form. But you will see that it is fairly self-explanatory and just easy to follow along. The screening form is uh, a two-page checklist that we use to screen for potential problems. Please go over every question with the applicant and asking it in multiple ways if that's necessary. And follow along as we go over the main questions of the screening form, which again, it is a, a deconstructed version of the N-400 application. So the first question, basic, are you at least 18 years old? Um, or have you had, and have you had your green card for five or three years? The form will also ask um, for any names or aliases, if they have used any other names, uh, if they have changed their name or want to change their name. Our N-400 form does ask for all versions of their names to make sure that they're able to do a thorough background check for the applicant. So this is why you will want to make sure that they have listed all of their potential names. And now you will assess whether the person can meet the English and history requirements. Um, you will have determined in the tracking form if they qualify for an exception to the English requirement. But if not, go on to test the literacy using the literacy test cards at your station. Um, if they make a few mistakes, you can recommend ESL classes through a referral. Um, and if their English skills are very poor, explain the English requirement and recommend classes before they apply. Or they could wait until they qualify for the exemption. If they're insistent about moving ahead in spite of their poor English, 
please document what you advised about the necessity of English classes. Our preference is that if a person is illiterate, then they should wait to apply and be referred out of the workshop. But in question two, uh, asks whether they um, they think that they can learn the 100 history questions and give a few examples if necessary. If they have very poor no English or think that they could not learn the history ex uh, exam questions, um, ask question three, which concerns the disability waiver. And this is for individuals who have a medical condition such as dementia, strokes, or PTSD, which prevents them from learning or remember information. Again, and if they have such a medical condition or said that they have memory problems, then they may be eligible for a waiver and should be again referred out. So the question regarding other citizenship options relates to whether uh, the person may already be a US citizen. As discussed earlier, having a US citizen parent may mean that a person derived uh, citizenship from that parent. And if so, ask when that parent became a US citizen and how old the applicant was at the time. Um, the screening experts, you should further question if the person was under 18 when their parent uh, was or became a US citizen. Um, but remember that if the person was admitted as an LPR under 18 and is in the legal and physical custody of the US citizen parent, they may already be a US citizen. And sometimes it even helps to ask if their grandparents became US citizens and maybe potentially derived US citizenship to the participants parents and now the, part the parents didn't know that they had become US citizens either. So the beginning of the screening form asks how a person got their permanent residence. We asked this question to make sure that they had lawful admission to the United States when they got their green card. Um, so the green card code is uh, is a code that indicates in what category they entered as an LPR. We want to feel assured that admission in this category was lawful. So as a screener, your job is to ask about how they got their permanent resident status, such as through a family member, through work, or as a refugee. So check the code on the green card and write that down. We'll have a list of admission codes in the screening room uh, to check what category the code represents. And the screening expert who signs off on your red flags checklist may ask additional questions of the participant to confirm that this admission was proper. Not only this helps you understand whether the admission was proper, but it also helps you understand for residency requirements if the participant qualifies under the three-year rule or five-year rule for residency. I hope this is all coming together as we review the questions and we are kind of going through our eligibility criteria again. So question five on the screening form asks about long trips outside of the United States and relates to the requirements of residency and physical presence. Although in screening, we ask about any trips since getting their green card, the N-400 only asks about trips in the last five years. So we ask about any trips because we want to screen for abandonment issues as well as continuous residence. You should write down any trips over six months even if possible, if outside the last five years. So if they have long trips, you can ask follow up questions about the reason for the trip or ties maintained to the United States while gone. Many applicants will come prepared with the N with N 400 worksheet, their intake form, and that should list all trips. So remember, if a person has a trip one year or longer within the last five years, they will have to wait until at least four years and one day um, after they return from their trip. Trips over six months within the statutory period require follow up questions and likely will result in a referral out of uh, for representation. So this section relates to physical presence in the US and asking if the person has been outside the US for more than two and a half years during the last five years. If it appears that the person is close to that period, you may need to count the days they were gone. Um, again, the applicant needs to at least uh, need to have been for 912 days or 30 months of physical presence during the last five years uh, to meet that requirement. So as a screener, you should only need to ask question 
uh, the last question on section on part five. If you determine uh, in question four that the person obtained their LPR status as an asylee. So if your participant is an asylee uh, who traveled back to their country from which they sought asylum, they may raise questions about the validity, validity of the original asylum grant. So even though a recent case law confirms that adjustment to permanent resident status terminates asylee status, we still want to be careful that there are no problems related to the validity of an applicant's status. So because of these, in most cases, we will refer these applicants out. So if you're working with an asylee and they have returned to their country of ori origin for which they sought asylum, that is a red flag and we will have to refer them out. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try to get through these quickly. Um, yep, oh, I have a lot of slides still. I'm sorry. I don't know why I've taken longer than anticipated. I hope you can stay for a couple more minutes. If not, I will be sending out the um, recording so you can finish whenever you can. So question six asks about polygamy, which is about two good moral character. Uh, this practice of having um, more than one spouse. If a person came to the U.S. to practice polygamy during the last five years, it is a mandatory bar to show in good moral character. So in addition, if their LPR status or ability to apply to naturalization um, hinges on their marriage to a U.S. citizen, anything that calls that marriage into question is a concern. Uh, this section also asks about alimony and child support. Willfully failing to support one's dependents is a discretionary bar to showing good moral character. If someone failed to support their dependents, but it was not willful because they couldn't contact them or because they were unemployed, for example, they could potentially overcome this bar to good moral character. Uh, if an applicant has minor One children quick question. overseas. Yes. Uh, are, are we asking if they're practicing this currently or are we asking if there is a record of this practice? Are you asking about polygamy or failure to pay alimony? Both of them. Right. So um, these can be discretionary bars. So if they have happened in the last five years, they would bar them. But this is something that we would want to ask in general if there's any record um, and then flag it as a red flag. For, yes. for polygamy. So, so, so we are not we are not saying that if there is no record of this, we are not asking them to to report it. You're just asking them if there's any records and if yes, there are any it. records, then you would flag flag it for our expert attorney. Got it. Thanks. So if if the person tells you like, yes, I used to be married to two people, um, then that's definitely a red flag that you will mark. It doesn't matter how long ago it was, you will want to look into de more detail whether it was while well, they were married to a U.S. citizen, whether it was um, in the last five years or not. Similarly, uh, if it's child support, you will want to know if it was in the last five years um, and the reason why that was a failure. So it would always be a red flag. At that point, you will want to contact the experts and they will help you kind of uh, dive in more in detail as to whether this is a discretionary bar, whether they can exempt it, whether it's better to refer, um, or whether we think it's okay to move forward. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your question. And I'm sorry, I'm moving a little bit quickly through all of these. Uh, so we will also make sure to ask about whether they qualify for any public benefits. And this is uh, due to fraud. Fraud is a good moral character concern. Um, and it's whether someone uh, lied to receive benefits during an interview. So there will be questions about, um, about that. But you will also want to ask about whether they receive public benefits, because at that point, the participant may qualify for a fee waiver. So our um, the application right now is $760. Uh, dollars to file on paper, and it is um, seven hundred and ten dollars to file online. We will not be doing any online filings because it requires the participants to be very tech savvy. Um, if the participants household income is under 400 percent of the federal poverty lines, 
they would qualify for a reduced fee waiver, which is $380. Um, but then if they receive any public benefits, uh, food stamps, Medicare, Apple Health, um, or they're unemployed, they're likely going to, they will qualify for a full fee waiver. Uh, so then the application cost will be free. This is something that you will all be receiving guidance and training on the morning off for how to screen it. It's very, very simple. Um, so you will be asking if they receive any public benefits, then automatically they are eligible for the fee waiver, which will be uh, completed by our form fillers at the next station. But you will be receiving detailed training about the fee waivers. On Saturday, I didn't want to fit it in here because we are covering a lot of material. So um, question eight asks about false claims to US citizenship and unlawful voting. Someone may have made a false claim to citizenship at a port of entry or on an I-9 form. Um, so when registering to vote uh, or to name a few. Um, so each of these issues asked about uh, in this question, making a false claim to US citizenship, um, are all discretionary bars uh, to showing good moral character. So this means that if the person can provide a reasonable explanation, such as that it was a good faith mistake, uh, it may be possible to overcome this bar. There is also an exemption for those applicants who had U.S. citizen parents, and they were when there were LPRs before age 16, and then who reasonably believed that they were U.S. citizens at the time that they made the false claim to citizenship, or voted. So if a person is registered to vote they will need to deregister uh, with their county election board and obtain their voting history um, as, uh, as a first step of resolving this issue. But these bars uh, to good moral character can sometimes be overcome. It is important to note that both unlawful voting and making false claims to US citizenship are deportable acts. Um, so applicants with these red flags will need to submit additional evidence and will be referred out for legal representation. So the section that uh, in our screening form that talks about taxes and failure to file tax returns or pay taxes, both of which are discretionary bars to showing good moral character, but an applicant who owes back taxes can still show good moral character. Um, if they show that they have uh, a payment plan with in place with the IRS and they're making payments. Um, also, not filing taxes may not be a problem if the person can show that they were not working or were not earning enough to file taxes. Um, the form used to ask about have you failed to file taxes, but there was a new version to the N-400 this year uh, which changed the wording on the word and now it only asks if the applicant owes any taxes, and if that is the case, whether they have a payment plan in place. Uh, thank you, Cindy. I will send the recording uh, as, uh, soon. And yes, if anybody needs to step out, uh, I think I will need 10 more minutes, but if you need to step out to another meeting, I will send the, the recording. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, I have like 10 more minutes left. So part 10 asks about associations with terrorism, communism, or gangs. Um, any of these involvements can be can bar someone from naturalizing. For example, if a person has any voluntary involvement in communist activities, they cannot naturalize until 10 years after their last involvement. But there is exceptions if someone's involvement in the Communist Party was required by law and that they had to participate in order to obtain food, to work, or other necessities in life. So in that case, participants can write an addendum about their experience and proceed through the naturalization workshop. Any other yes answers to this question should be flagged for further review by a complex attorney. Um, question 11 asks about the person's criminal history, if any. Uh, we ask many detailed questions about a person's interaction with the criminal justice system, including arrests, fines, charges in court, convictions, jail time, time, and so forth. So be sure to take the time to ask these questions and write down details of the incident. 
Applicants need to disclose all interactions with the criminal justice system in the N-400 form. USCIS generally requests court, court records for all criminal matters as well. So many crimes can bar good moral character and some are also grounds for removal. For this reason, anyone with a criminal history will be referred to complex cases um, for additional advice. So if someone has only traffic violations, they can continue through the workshop as long as they understand that all the fines should be paid off before the interview. I'm going to skip this slide because it is no longer relevant. Um, so drug usage and convictions can cause serious problems for non-citizens. Uh, before asking about drug problems, screeners will want to read a warning statement about marijuana use, which will be provided to you at the workshop. Uh, having been convicted of or admitting to a controlled substance offense is a bar to showing good moral character and a grant of removal. So even though marijuana for personal use is legal under state law, possession is still a federal crime. So and, and as such can have an increased risk for non-citizens. Being a drug user or addict is a removal issue and may be triggered simply by something an applicant admits. So as, as such, it is very important that applicants do not discuss any drug uh, use with immigration officers without first talking to an immigration attorney. In addition, if an immigration officer has reason to believe that someone is a drug trafficker based on information of a police report, for example, that is also a bar to showing good moral character. Um, the N-400 form also asks about domestic violence history, uh, and it is a red flag when the person has been the perpetrator of the domestic violence. A finding that a person violated a non-contact order or domestic violence protection order is a potential removal issue. Um, and it's also a ground for deportation. So any participants with history of domestic violence will be referred out uh, to a complex case attorney. Um, if, if the participant is a victim of uh, domestic violence, also please note it on the client tracking form because the N-400 form allows for applicants, victims of domestic violence, to not list their addresses on the form. So this is something that we will need to flag for our form fillers. And I know that I just want to flag also the screening form um, is repetitive. It will ask the same questions within the form fillers will be asking. And some of these questions can be very intrusive. A lot of participants just like think they're almost silly because there's so many of them and they're so detailed and they're just really crazy. But uh, for some, these questions can be very overwhelming and they can um, flare up. Uh, past trauma. And so I think it's helpful if you just kind of prepare your participants before you start the screening process about um, how important it is that they answer truthfully and they provide all this information and that you understand that some of this information can be very personal. So if they need time, if they need water, um, if they need to kind of keep going and then return to a question that's too difficult, please give them that option as well. Um, so again, fraud and misrepresentation uh, is uh, a big topic in naturalization form and it relates to providing false information to government officials. This could be a government agency that administers public benefits or an immigration agency providing immigration benefits, such as a visa or entry to the U.S. So if a person gave false informa information, such as misrepresenting their income to a state agency, uh, this could be a discretionary bar. Uh, giving false testimony to get an immigration benefit is also a mandatory bar to good moral character. Um, this type of false testimony must have been given orally under oath and does not necessarily need to be material to being eligible for the benefit. So, for example, if someone gave false information regarding their travel history at a citizenship interview three years ago, they would be unable to show good moral character until that misrepresentation was more than five years ago. 
uh, giving false information um, to an immigration official can result in the loss of LPR status as well. For example, if someone gave false information to get a green card, such as entering a fraudulent marriage, this could result in the loss of status. Or if someone received an immigrant visa in a family visa category that required them to be unmarried, but they were actually married, this is false information that could result in loss of status. Uh, so question 17 relates to alien smuggling, uh, a term that is broadly defined by immigration to include many types of aiding, assisting, or abetting someone to enter the U.S. without inspection. This includes not just acting as a coyote or smuggler, but things such as like sending money to pay for a smuggler or walking across the border with someone who doesn't have papers. This also includes like assisting your family members or children that are coming with you. So any act deemed alien smuggling is a mandatory bar to good moral character if it occurred during the statutory period, but it is unfortunately also a ground of deportation. So if there was not a conviction, if it happened at the time of someone's entry, before entry or within the five years, if someone was convicted of alien smuggling, it would be a permanent bar to showing good moral character. Uh, so if this red flag comes up in any case, they will be referred to complex uh, cases for advice. So you will be wanting to inquire at this point whether any of their direct family members, children or spouses are undocumented and how they um, entered into the United States and if there was like any assistance from the applicant for citizenship. Also, you will want to ask if there's any prior removals and just like all of their immigration history, if they have ever entered an undocumented or been denied or deported, um, you will want to make sure to ask those, those, those questions. Um, so question 14 asks about selective service registration, which is a common good, uh, good moral character issue. Their rule is that all males between ages of 18 and 26, except for non-immigrants, um, are required to register for selective service. Uh, and so even if undocumented males are supposed to register, the only exception is uh, non-immigrants non registering. So. Uh, this is a good moral character problem when the person willfully fails to register. In many cases where the person did not register, it was because they were not aware of their requirement, which means that their failure to register was not willful. At the workshop, they can write an addendum to the N-400 with a brief statement to this effect. So if the applicant is unsure whether or not they're registered, you can check for their selective service registration. We have a public benefits navigator there that can help them navigate that. If the client is 25 years or younger, they can register. Um, and then if the client is 20, between 26 and 31 and they fail to register, um, this is still a discretionary bar to good moral character. But if the failure to register was not willful, they can submit an addendum explaining this. Um, the, the screening form will also ask the participant if they serve the military in any other countries and all military service must be disclosed. And then you will want to ask as well if the applicant has uh, applied for citizenship before. The reason that they were denied can be important to determining whether they will be successful this time. So this time, if a, if a prior application was denied because uh, of a reason that has been corrected, for example, they now have sufficient English or they have enough years of residence, then they can you can assist them at the workshop. But if the applicant was denied for another reason, such as good moral character issue or questions about their status, we'll likely need more records. Um, our naturalization eligibility criteria. Uh, we hope that this has been helpful in familiarizing yourself with the screening issues you'll be working with at the workshop. 
you will receive uh, the refresher training in the morning of the workshop before participants arrive and also be on the lookout for other training videos that deal with logistics of the and the flow of the workshop. Thank you so much for your willingness to volunteer and to help Seattle be a more welcoming city. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me uh, and my email here is listed at the last slide. And I will be sharing these slides and my notes with you as well. So thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And this concludes our training session for today. I'm, thank you. If, I don't know if you have any questions or we're done. Yep, I think everybody's done.